We're continuing our series on the book of Ephesians. How many have enjoyed the book of Ephesians as we continue to walk through this? It's been amazing. Um, Maybe some of you haven't. How many have enjoyed the book of Ephesians? Okay, good. All right. It's not my book, it's God's book, so you got to take it up with him if you don't like it. Um, But we're continuing, but today is a very practical message, and I believe it can be applied to every one of our lives, and uh, and what I love about the Bible, it is, it is really, really practical. A lot of people, they search for all, can, can, you, can you just tell me some mystery that the Bible doesn't really say plainly and, and somehow make something up and tell me when Jesus is coming back? Can you please tell me who the Antichrist is? Can you please tell me about the blood moons and then what date something's going to happen? And then, Let's talk about the things that the Bible doesn't totally make clear because that's what I like. Or... We can take, it, take a step back and say, what does the Bible clearly say that we can apply to our life and we can apply it in our lives and it can make a difference right now? I'd love, I, listen, mysteries, there's nothing wrong with, with looking into prophecy and we, we will teach and touch on that throughout the year and some of the things that have been fulfilled and that builds our faith. But I'm not going to spend a whole message and tell you something at the end and be like, so it might be that, it might not. I'm not going to do that. I want you to walk out of here with something in your quiver that you can use in your life that God went out of his way to to breathe into this, this Bible right here. So when we take it, we apply it to our lives, and we walk it out, and it, and it makes a difference. Most people, a lot of people want to know the mysteries, but they're ignoring what God plainly says. And so God wants to shape us and change us and bring transformation in our lives. And I think today is going to be one of those times. And so we want to look in here to the book of Ephesians. It is as clear as a bell. God is speaking to us. And here is Paul. He's writing a letter to the church, which is to you and to me and to the church in in Ephesus. And he's helping them determine how to have healthy relationships. The book of Ephesians begins by telling them about what Christ has done, what God has done through his son Jesus Christ, how he's redeemed you, how he's changed your identity, how it's really all about Jesus. The second half of the book is about how you can apply that. And here's the kicker. The second half of the book is about how you treat other people. So you you, you can talk all day long about how much you love Jesus, but if you don't love people around you, you're missing something. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, your nature should look more and more like Jesus every day. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you should not be cranky. Everybody say amen. You should be the most joy-filled, the most gracious, the least suspicious people on the planet. You're like, I don't like that. Uh Uh-uh. I'm suspicious of what you just said. How you treat each other matters. And so today, I want to look at one of the biggest things that, that all of us struggle with, and that is our relationships. And this is something that God speaks to all throughout Scripture. The Old Testament is about how we can understand God, and then how, after we understand God, how we are to treat other people. The New Testament, how we can understand God, and then how we can treat other people. How should we treat other people? And this context today is in the context of marriage. But some of the principles we're looking at today can apply all across the board to every relationship that you are in. And what I know about relationships is that for the most part, what if I was to ask you, what brings you the most conflict in your life? You probably wouldn't say the weather. You probably wouldn't say, well, my car breaks down every once in a while. You wouldn't say, well, my, my job. You would say, if you were to really be honest, you'd say, well, my relationships do. When I, when I look at my own life, when I look at, as, as, I, as I meet with many of you and as I interact with people, what, what I find is that interactions in people's lives, the one thing that can cause anxiety, can cause friction, can cause concern, can cause disappointment and fear, is when you look deeply into it, it's all can be traced back to this word called relationships. Now, how, how do I know that, that, that this actually relationships matters or the unity of relationships matters than anything else? Because you can meet somebody, they can have all the money in the world, they can have all the fame in the world, they can, they, they can be known and know a lot of people. They can have all kinds of pleasures. They could have vacation homes in all different types of places. But if they are in relational conflict, they are all out of sorts. If you are in the middle of a divorce, it doesn't matter what you have, you are miserable. 
You can have, you, everything can be perfect for you. If you are estranged from, your, from one of your children, you just cannot find peace. You can speak in tongues all day long, but if, but if you have a, a, an issue with someone at church and there's a struggle and there's bitterness in your heart, you are miserable and you're going to carry that on every area of your life. And so relationships matter. And so we're going to be looking at the Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verse 21, but before we put that up, I just, I, I, in most of your Bibles, as you pull that up, you can grab your Bible, look on your phone, whatever you have, but the heading of this passage or chunk of Scripture, the beginning of it says this, instructions for Christian households. The first thing that that tells me is that a Christian household should look different than a household of someone that doesn't know Jesus. It should look different. There should be something in there that's just, that's just different. I know this, this, this passage is specifically talking about marriage. This is something that's really speaking to all of us across every relationship. And so the home or the marriage is a very, very important part, though. Statistics will show, depending on the relationship or type of relationship you have in your family at home, will determine probably the will determine the course, unless God intervenes, of the other relationships you're going to have for the rest of your life. What you learn in the home and how to interact with one another and, and how, to, how to grow in your relationship with one another will determine how you're going to do the same throughout your life. And so this area of marriage, and what I think is really funny, when you talk to young people, and I was, I was a young people at one point, what I find funny is this, you know, when you get married, you think, you know what, or before you get married, you think, I got this marriage thing in the bag. I know how this is going to work. We're never going to disagree. Can you believe, sweetheart, that they disagree? Can you believe that? Remember, you're engaged. You're not married yet. Or, you know, we're not going to be like those people that have arguments. That's, we've never had an argument. This is amazing. We're, gonna, it's, we're always going to agree on how to discipline the kids. We're always going to agree on, on, on what we're going to have for dinner. We're always going to agree what we spend our finances on. We're always going to agree, to agree that we're just going to cuddle on the couch and do nothing else. We're always going to agree with that. I made you feel a little awkward by that comment, didn't I? <laughs> and all of a sudden you get into marriage and you realize, wait a minute, there, there's, we're, we're taking two two. Two people that grew up in two different homes with two different ways of relationships. <laughs> and when you're bringing them together and we're like, it's going to be easy. It's not always easy. But it's worth growing together because it brings glory and honor to God. And the reality is this. I had a perfect marriage until I got married. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, then the problem was I was in the marriage. That was the big problem. And Jesus wanted to take marriage, and he wanted to get something in my heart, but a lot, mostly, he wanted to get something out of my heart. And that's what he uses the beauty of marriage, and he uses relationships for us to do that. So how many here know that there's no such thing as a perfect marriage? Raise your hand. All right, good, good, good. Our goal, though, is to be healthy in our relationships. That's, that's, that's our goal. We as Christians should be always growing in the health of our relationships. And even though our goals are to have healthy relationships, sometimes we can get sick. Just like our physical bodies can get sick, we pick up viruses or bacteria. There are the same things in our relationships. We can pick up things along the way. And so your marriage can become sick. Your friendships actually can become sick. Your church culture, how you interact with one another, can actually become sick. And our relationships can, can begin to be unhealthy, and before you know it, you're a little sick. And what happens when you get sick? Sometimes you need to apply some medicine or some principles that can help you get better. And so this is what I know about something if it is sick. According to the Scripture, if it is sick, then our God can heal it. Amen? 
So that applies to all of your relationships. It applies to your marriage today as well. I believe these points today are going to be like medicine to your marriage and to your relationships. But before I get into these practical three very simple practical statements that's going to be based on Ephesians 5.21, I want to read to you some things I found online about statements about marriage that I'm not, I don't think they're all true. I just thought they were funny, and I thought I'd share them with you. Number one, husbands are the best people to share your secrets with. Because they'll never tell anyone because they aren't even listening. <laughs> That's funny. That's so funny. Number two, my husband thinks I'm crazy. However, he's the one who married me. Number three, before marrying someone, this is my favorite, you should first make them use a computer with slow internet just to see who they really are. <laughs> Number four, never laugh at your wife's choices because you are one of them. <laughs> Number five, I love being married. It's so great to find that special one person that you get to annoy for the rest of your life. I don't agree with that, but anyway, it's funny. Number six, this is from actually a quote from Albert Einstein. Men marry women with the hope they will never change. Women marry men with the hope they will change. Invariably, they are both disappointed. <laughs> Number seven, all men make mistakes, but married men find out about them sooner. <laughs> so this passage today is talking about what does a gospel-centered, spirit-filled home mean? look like. And this passage today, before I get into it, it has an offensive word in it, so I apologize for some of you who would be offended by this. It's, uh, it's offensive in most relationships, both in Christian and non-Christian relationships. And when this word is spoken, most people, Christian or non-spoken, it, they, they kind of, it sends shivers down their spine. Some people just get like, like, like automatic stank face. There's face screws all up because they hate the word. But the beginning of this passage from the word of God is this word right here. It is the word submit. Don't leave, just hang tight. We're going to get there. Ephesians 5.21 says this. Submit. Everybody say submit. Amen. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is our passage today. Simple, just one. I want to read to you um, um, a commentary. He was a pastor as well, commentary writer. His name is Ray Stedman. What he wrote about Ephesians 5.21. And it, it's, I, I just want you to listen to how he describes this passage. He says, Ephesians 5, 21, 21 is, divine, is the divine solution to the problem of conflict between individuals, those areas of friction where life is rubbed raw, and the ugly sores of violence and conflict often erupt. The oldest battle of all time is the battle of the sexes. The longest war ever waged is the war that goes on between husbands and wives. Divorce statistics point out the fact that marriage is the greatest area of conflict among human beings, far surpassing the statistics of war. Even in Christian homes, the degree of squabbling, bickering, coldness, bitterness, and even violence that is encountered by any marriage counselor is simply unbelievable. The atmosphere in many a Christian home is no better than that of an armed truce. There is nothing more important that we obey and hear these simple words of the apostle as he applies this tremendous formula for marital peace. Subjection or submission, therefore, is not merely to be on the part of one alone, but in the case of Christian husbands and wives is to be done by both. The husband is to submit himself to the wife as much as the wife is to the husband. The method will differ according whether male or female, but the principle is the same for each. This attitude of mutual submission, it can change your marriage. It can change your relationships. And this is, I, I want to talk to you about some statements that will demonstrate 
mutual submission. And that we can use them, hopefully, after this message, you can use them in a very practical way in your life. And I believe if you will use these statements and grow in using these statements, it can heal your marriage, it can heal your relationships, it can heal your, your connection with your children, with your grandchildren, with your people at work, with the people at church. I really believe it can, it can transform and change us today. So the first statement that can heal is statement number one, I was wrong. Let's say that together. I was wrong. I want to point out something just real quick before I get into this. My encouragement to you about this statement of saying I was wrong, before, I guess my encouragement to you is try saying I was wrong before you have a fight about how you were not wrong. Because in most cases, if we were all honest, you knew all along you were really wrong, but you didn't want to admit it. Amen? Let's just be honest. Everybody say amen. It's good for your soul to confess. This is good. This is good. And this is about us being self-aware, about us not being filled with pride. And so saying I was wrong in a relationship, it begins to build a bridge of restoring that relationship. It's a demonstration that you are mutually submitted that says this, I will not always be right. And there are going to be times that I'm going to be wrong. If you can't say this statement, if this is so hard for you to say, you are not submitted to anyone else and you're only serving yourself. You might be married but you don't have a marriage if you've never said this statement. It's hard to admit you're wrong. I understand that. We all are filled with pride. We all struggle with this, I want to always be right, but that is not being mutually submitted to anybody. But the reality is we all make mistakes. And if I was to ask people in this room, hey, raise your hand, and you don't have to do this, raise your hand here if you're perfect. Nobody would. So what makes us think that we would never make a mistake and have to say these words, I was wrong. Because we would all admit we're not perfect. And what that means is there's going to come a time when these simple words will be powerful for you and can bring healing to your own heart, but can bring healing to your marriage. Ogden Nash, who was a poet in the early 1900s, he said this, to keep your marriage cup brimming with love in your loving cup, whenever you're wrong, admit it. Whenever you're right, shut up. <laughs> One of the biggest barriers to marital and relational happiness is this attitude. It's not my fault. Uh-uh. I, I said that because you said that. I acted this way because you acted that way. So we deflect everything. Well, I had a bad attitude. I'd send a nasty email because you did something. Excuse me. Everything is everyone else's fault. You, you don't take any responsibility for your own actions and reactions. And sometimes a husband or a wife will think that they are always right and any problem in the relationship is always the fault of the other partner. And we spend a lot of our relationships in our marriages or even in our families Always just saying, yeah, but I, I'm not wrong. You're wrong. If you can't fathom the idea or can't ever say that you're wrong or can't ever come to the place of humility to say, man, I'm not perfect. I'm wrong. I'd be willing to bet you don't have a lot of close relationships because this applies across the board for every relationship. Both men and women struggle with this. In most cases, one of the spouses in a marriage ends up the one always saying, I, I, okay, okay, I was wrong, okay. They may not even be wrong. But in a marriage where someone cannot say I was wrong, usually ends with someone always taking the blame. Always just, I, I, okay, I, okay, I was wrong. Why? Because you, you don't want to live in turmoil. You just think, I, I just got to say I was wrong cause, so if we can have some peace in the house. So I, I, I was wrong. I mean, you, you will admit and the other spouse will admit that I was, I was wrong, e even if they did nothing. This is tough to say I was wrong. But it is a statement of mutual submission. Any relationship that neither one or only one can say I was wrong 
is a relationship that's going to suffer. You might even be thinking, but Jason, what's the big deal? The only, it's, it's just my marriage. It's my business. You get out of my business. Leave me alone. Here, here's, here's my responsibility to you. It just doesn't affect you, and it just doesn't affect your spouse or your friend or someone at church. But actually, it affects the relationship between you and God. It affects a lot more than what you think. Unrestored relationships actually just, just don't affect the other person. It, it, can, it can sabotage your life and your relationship with God. Unrestored relationship, number one, is this. It hinders, or is a, it hinders our worship. Unrestored relationships hinder our worship. Now, I, I didn't say that. I didn't make that up. Jesus said that. Matthew chapter 5 says this. She's, Jesus said, therefore, if you are offering your gift or if you're, if you're worshiping at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. you you've done something. You, you know that there is a, it is an unrestored relationship. Leave your gift in front of the altar and first go to be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Now, this is challenging to some of you. This is challenging because what you do is you justify every, every um, relationship that's in friction. You justify it because you're like, yes, but I can't be wrong because I, I worship God. I connect with God. God speaks to me. But here God is saying, don't worship me until you go and make things right with your brother or sister. That's a strong statement. Most of us think, I'm going to worship God and, and, well, it's their fault. That's really what many of us are saying. So you can, Jesus is saying you can't even worship properly if you're out of fellowship with another believer or your spouse. And this happens probably every Sunday morning in here. I mean, you wake up in the morning, and all of a sudden Johnny spills his cereal. You know, Susie pulls Johnny's hair or probably the opposite. And so all of a sudden things start blowing up. You and your wife run into each other and you, she burns her hand with a curling iron. And, and you know, you're all frustrated. You get in the car and you're mad at each other. Well, you, can you get out of the way? And maybe something is said in a way you shouldn't say. And you get in the car and you drive to church and it's so cold in your car you could hang meat in it. But when you get here, you're not even talking. You get here, you get the kids out and you think, Okay, I'll, let's just hold hands so they think we like each other. And you walk in. <laughs> and you come in and you try to worship and you can't. <sighs> Frustrated and mad. And you put the kids between you because you don't want to sit next to the other person. And Why, why would Jesus be talking about worship and relationships in the same context? It's, it's really interesting. I believe it's because when you are in worship, you are most likely to realize that certain relationships probably aren't right. You begin to think about some things. In other words, when you see God and you begin to worship him as we did this morning, exalting and lifting Jesus high, you begin to see his holiness. It makes us aware of the sin in our lives. And even, even at this moment, right here in this church, there are people who are here who are on a long, drawn-out conflict in your family, maybe with your spouse. And I'm praying that as you hear these words and you listen to the words of Jesus, that you're going to become sensitive to the Holy Spirit and you're going to have the, you're, by God's grace, you're going to have the ability to say, I was wrong. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit shines a spotlight of his love and his conviction deep, deep in your heart. And you'll be able to say, and you'll be able to leave here and maybe even go home and admit to your, to your spouse, you know what, I was wrong. You'll be able to say to a friend, I was wrong. Because there's a friction there. So, someone, has to, someone has to give. Nothing's gonna, someone has to say, I was wrong. And if you have any part in that guilt, I pray that God would help you to do that today. The second biblical truth about our relationships that are not restored is number two, they need to be addressed sooner than later. Now, every single one of us are procrastinators when it comes to restoring relationships. In other words, don't sweep it under the rug. Don't just turn the other cheek. Actually, you need to address it and deal with it. 
Because I, I, I've always thought this, that it's better to do it God's way in the beginning instead of asking him to clean up our mess in the end. And God wants us to deal with some things. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. This scripture is loaded with, with several very powerful principles here. But yes, you know, we get angry, and, and, and there's, actually there's nothing wrong with being angry. There's a kind of righteous anger that, that can be directed towards sin or injustice or something. We just, oh, we're, we're angry about it, but not towards a person. And it's okay to get angry, but, don't, but please hear me. Don't allow your anger to cause you to sin. Because unrighteous anger makes you say unkind and hurtful things that should not be said. And on the back end of it, you're saying, yeah, but I'm right. And what will happen, your unrighteous anger will help you. You will systematically pull someone apart with your words. You will try to discourage them. Well, they'll say something positive. You'll say three things negative to them. You will assault them with their words. You, you will begin to point out things they did wrong and why they shouldn't have done this and this. And you, you'll point, well, yes, because your mama does that. It's because your daddy does that. It's because your friends do that. And because it, this is why you are what you are. You will, and then you will degrade them and systematically. And then when they come to the place where they're broken and you're like, well, I just wanted to share that with you. Why? Because it's called unrighteous anger. And you have just sinned. You can be righteous and angry, but then blow it by sinning and how you express your anger. I see it all the time. They have, there's anger in someone that might be justified or it's something very important to them and someone doesn't agree with them and so they're angry about it, which many times you shouldn't be, but some people are. And then they open their mouth and then you're like, oh, Okay. And a person who just always speaks what they want to say and there's no filter on their mouth whatsoever, again, is a person that doesn't have a lot of deep relationships. Or people who are mature in their life actually try to speak to them and they reject it. But if that is you, and all of us, this will be all of us at one point, the Bible gives a timetable on when to deal with our broken relationships. Do not let the sun go down while you were still angry. In other words, God wants us to deal with broken relationships, unrestored relationships, sooner than later. And so in the context of marriage, do your best not to go to bed angry at each other. Do your best. Or at least acknowledge you were wrong and that you'll talk about it tomorrow. Cheryl and I, we have an 11 p.m. rule. Someone gave us this advice many, many years ago that after 11 p.m., we're not going to talk about things any, anymore. And I'll tell you why. Because when you are tired, well, actually, I haven't applied this yet because we haven't gotten to an argument, so I'm waiting for the 11 p.m. <laughs> I'm totally joking. <laughs> when you're tired and when you're cranky and you're at the end of the day and your flesh is screaming because you are tired and you aren't cranky and the kids have been pulling on you and, and, all the, and things happen at work and you come together and you begin to work through something and you realize we are in no place to work on something right now. But what happens is, you know what, you say, okay, I was wrong, I love you, let's go to bed and let's discuss this tomorrow. By doing this, you don't, you don't go to bed filled with pride. You, you invite the Holy Spirit into you. The, the, a key is to pray together. And let me tell you, the last thing you want to do when you're in relational conflict with someone is pray with that someone. It's the last thing you want to do. But you crucify your flesh and you take the hands of your sweetheart or your friend or whoever it is. Say, let's pray and then let's pick this up tomorrow. And you're inviting God to change you. In many cases, this is what happens. A couple starts to argue and the volume intensified and the argument starts, go, it starts getting hotter and hotter. And before long, they're really into it. They've gone a few rounds. And, man, they even take a water break because they're just too tired. And they come back and do it again. And, and it, it seems things are never going to be resolved. And this is a, a big issue. So they just quit. They don't say anything about it. 
They don't acknowledge any guilt. They don't say they need God's help. They give each other the silent treatment. They're steaming, and they go to bed, and you can park a semi in between where each one of them is sleeping. I mean, they're all, they might have a king-size bed, but they're going to sleep on like seven inches of the bed on each side. They don't, they don't look at each other. They just go to bed. And the next morning they get up. They don't hardly talk. They don't talk to each other. They go off to their work, their daily life, and they come home. And guess what? The tension is still there. It's thick. You can cut it with a knife. The Bible says you should settle it quickly and don't allow that to happen. Listen, all marriages have conflict. All healthy marriages have had to work through conflict and still have conflict in the middle of being in a healthy marriage. But they learn to deal with it quickly. In unhealthy marriages, conflict carries over to every other area. And these are unsettled disputes that's like an open sore that hasn't been cleansed and bacteria's got in there and it's, and it's swollen and it's infected and you touch it and pus comes out and it's just nasty and the smallest little thing that happens can just set you off over somehow about a, the fork wasn't in the right place in the, right, in the drawer and all of a sudden everything just, just goes crazy. Why? Because you've never addressed an issue ever. If you don't deal with your unrestored, broken relationships, it will affect your spiritual life and your relationship further. Because these are statements of mutual submission. This, you know what, I'm not perfect. And the other person thinks, I'm not perfect. And you think, out of reverence to Christ, we will submit to one another. Ephesians 4 says this. It's interesting. As we continue to read the end of this this chapter, or this verse we just read, it says, do not give the devil a foothold. So your unrestored relationships, when you don't, when you don't obey, when you, when you just c- carry on conflict, it gives the enemy a foothold in your, in your marriage. When we don't settle your marriage conflict, sooner or later, you are inviting the enemy to come in and to set up shop, to drive a wedge further between you and your spouse. Because he, he, that's, that's his whole job. He wants, to, he wants to drive a wedge between every child, every parent, every brother, and every sister in Christ. That's what he wants to do. And if you don't resolve that conflict, that's what's going to happen. God creates, he makes, and he unifies. The enemy destroys, and he calls disunity. He, he, he divides. And he wants to, to divide the unity of this church, just so you know that. He wants to divide the unity of your marriage. He wants to divide the unity of, of your whole family. And how does he do that? When we don't resolve conflict or at least humble ourselves and take a step and say, I was wrong. We need to work on this. He has a foothold. Healthy people say things like this. I was wrong. I was wrong in what I said. I was wrong in how I said it. I was wrong in what I did. I was wrong in what I didn't do that I needed to do. I was wrong. Everyone say with me, I was wrong. I was wrong. Great. You've just completed your first session of therapy. God bless you. (laughs) Second statement that heals is number two. Will you please forgive me? Very practical today. This is about repenting. When you have contributed to a broken relationship, you don't need to just admit you were wrong, but then you need to ask for forgiveness See, first one, I was wrong. That's, that's easy. Finally, we take that step. But if you still have an issue with pride in your life, when most of us do, this, this one here is going to just, it's, you, you're going to you're gonna have to die to your flesh and say, will you please forgive me? Most people, the finally, those, okay, finally, I was, I, I was wrong. But they don't take this step. I know a lot of people that don't take this step. And admitting you're you're wrong is not the same as asking for forgiveness. Many people stop at the first statement. But if you hurt someone to say, I was wrong for hurting you. Oh, yes, you were. Thank you. Then you say, will you please forgive me for hurting you? Something happens in the atmosphere of your own heart and in their heart as well. Asking for forgiveness, it's, it's more than regretting that you did something. Regret says that you did the wrong thing, and if you had to do it over again, you you probably wouldn't do it. And you may or may not even be sorry that you did it. You just know that it was wrong, and you regret it. 
The only sorrow I believe attached to regret is, is often, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry. Asking for forgiveness is more than regret, and actually it's more than remorse. Remorse means that you know that you did the wrong thing, you regret it, and you're genuinely sorry that you did it. You feel badly about what you did, not because you got caught, but because someone else was hurt. So that makes you feel bad because your actions caused someone to be hurt. But really, it's more about, it's, it's, forgiveness is more about, is much more than regret. It's much more than remorse. It's, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? And repenting. And our human relationships has a real connection with what it means to repent before God. It's very important that we understand this. Because true repentance produces the change in two areas of our lives. True repentance produces a change of heart and produces a change of conduct. So no, nothing, nothing happens in our conduct unless first our heart is transformed. That's why I never understood some of the, the, the church I grew up in as a, as a young boy. It's, it, you know, when someone would come in and they always wanted to change their conduct before their heart was ever changed. Listen, as a church body, you, we, this is something you need to understand. Do not expect an unsaved person to act like a saved person. Okay? You know, well, you, no, that's wrong. No, that's a sin. Okay, that's fine. They, they don't know it's a sin until their heart's been regenerated. And then, then if, when their heart is made new, then their desires begin to be reflective of their heart. And then, wait a minute, that's wrong. I shouldn't do that. God doesn't want that for my life. And so it's all about change. Repentance means I'm going to change. Repent, and actually, the biblical word for repentance means a new direction or with a new understanding. Something transforms in my life. And here's the other thing. Repentance is never a one-time thing. Even in our walk with, with, with Jesus, I've heard some Christians say this. You know what? Once you're, once you're saved, you don't have to repent for sin anymore. I totally, totally, absolutely reject that thinking. Now, when you repent after you're saved, it's not about, you're not repenting for salvation. You are humbling yourself and acknowledging before God, I did not live up to who I really am. And I'm asking you to help me, God. I'm ask, I ask for your forgiveness. Remove from me the stain of that sin that is touching my life or affecting or infecting my life. Imagine if, if, if you took that same mindset into your marriage to say, sweetheart, I know I just screwed up. But remember, I apologized 15 years ago for something, so I don't need to apologize anymore. Repentance with God, it's not totally about him. It's about you acknowledging that you still need him. And in a marriage and in relationship, we have to repent constantly. I'm so sorry. I'm working on that. Will you please forgive me? And that brings us to the third statement that heals, and, that, and that's this. I forgive you. These are three statements that demonstrate that you are mutually submitted to your spouse, you're mutually submitted to other people in the body of Christ, that it's not all about you, it's about Jesus. Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. This is what I know. You will never have to forgive anyone anymore then Christ has had to forgive you. You will never have to forgive anyone any more than Christ has had to forgive you. Forgiveness doesn't mean you forget. Listen, I understand. There are things, and, and, and listen, if, you've, if your spouse has been unfaithful to you, you're never going to forget that, but you can forgive them. God, God never commands us to forget things ever done against us, but he does command us to forgive when things have been done against us. God's the only one who is righteous and holy who chooses to forget. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that he just forgets like, oh, yeah, that's right, I've totally forgot. He chooses to forget and remove from us our sins so they are no more. It's his choice to forget. 
And for us, until we get to heaven, we're still going to carry the, the assaults and the stain and the pain of things that have been done against us. But the reality is this. That statement of I forgive you, it can bring healing deep in your heart. And what forgiveness does mean is this. Is we let go of any desire of revenge. That's what it means. There's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of what forgiveness really means. And when the, the day of atonement of the nation of Israel, the high priest would take two lambs or two goats, and it was a time for them to repent for their sins. So there were two male lambs and, 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 and goats, and, and one lamb was killed, and its blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. The other ram was called a scapegoat. That's where we get our term called a scapegoat. And it was left alive after the high priest would leave the Holy of Holies. He would walk outside the, the city walls and there would be a goat there on the day of atonement. He would lay his hands on, that, on the horns of the goat and he would, he would symbolically place on that goat every sin of the nation of Israel. He placed it on him and he would, he, he would begin to speak it over him. Instead of killing that goat, he would then release that goat and that goat would be led away into the wilderness. Thus it is the scapegoat. That is what Jesus Christ became for us. That we, we, he, he took upon himself our sin. It was placed all on him. And then he himself was also the lamb that was sacrificed and the lamb that rose from the dead and is alive today. We no longer bear the stain of that sin. And that is what it means to forgive. You allow that, you, you forgive, you release, you, you send them away. The, the sin is given somewhere else and you no longer are going to punish that the goat or the, or the person who has embodied that sin. You're no longer going to punish them. You're going to release them and you no longer want revenge for them. That's true forgiveness. And only God's grace can help you do that. You can't do it on your own. But what I love about that picture of what Christ was for us, that's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus in the wilderness, he looked at him, he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That he saw Jesus, he's the scapegoat. He's the one. That's what forgiveness is. And how do you know, again, that you truly forgiven? You let go of the desire for them to be hurt or for them to to be punished. I'm going to read you something out of a book by Philip Yancey. And we'll close with this. And actually this is a book that's written about grace. He said this, At last I understood in the final analysis that forgiveness is an act of faith. By forgiving another, I am trusting that God is, better, is a better justice maker than I am. By forgiving, I release my own right to get even. And I leave all issues of fairness and judgment for God to work out. I leave in God's hands the scales that must be balanced by his justice and his mercy. And here's the reality. You cannot release and do that without God's help. And I know many of you have been hurt deeply. You've been betrayed you may have been physically harmed. You may have been abused. You, you may have had been verbally assaulted. You may, you may be carrying deep pain and deep sorrow today. And I do not mean to make light of the things that you've had to walk through and you've had to process through. I don't know why God allowed that to happen to you. But what I do know today is that through the, His Son, Jesus Christ, God offers you the power and the grace to extend forgiveness to someone who has harmed you and who has hurt you. To set you free from the stain of that sin. I believe it. You, you might be a product of, of the past and the things that were done to you. But in Jesus Christ, you are not a prisoner to it. And he gives you power to release. Power to to forgive and Jesus Christ is the one who has set the example for us to follow and these statements if we will use them and apply them in our relationships in our marriage even, even this last statement of I forgive you even saying it when you don't feel it 
Let your own two ears hear what you should be processing through. Begin to speak it over your life. I forgive you. Everything inside of you says, I don't forgive you. Say it. I forgive you. Release them. Even today, on your way home, even if you need to get just alone, go for a walk this afternoon. Begin to think of the person who has hurt you and you were struggling. You want revenge for them. You want them to be dealt with. And some of that is righteous. There's nothing wrong with that. If, if, it's a, if it's a legal issue, if they broke the law or they assaulted you or abused you, listen, you take that the legal route. God has set up that for them to be punished and justified. But in your own hearts, begin to say, I forgive you. I forgive you. And every time you say it, it's like a seed that begins to grow. I believe forgiveness, it's, it's not this instantaneous, oh, just, just forgive them. I, I know it doesn't happen that way. But I believe it's a lot like pregnancy. There's a, there's a seed. And you make the choice, I'm going to forgive God, give me the grace. And you begin to water that seed. That seed begins to grow, and just like a pregnancy, there are going to be times when you, you are, you are you're sick to your stomach because you don't want to. Your flesh is just fighting against the decision that you've made by the Spirit. And you, you, you don't want to forgive, and, and you've got morning sickness, and sometimes because, because the bitterness actually became a part of your identity, you almost want to return to that because you're more, more comfortable with that. You're more familiar with that. But Jesus is wanting to set you free from the stronghold of bitterness in your life. And he's asking you, just begin, come on, keep, just stay in there. But you begin to pray, Lord, I forgive them. Lord, help me to forgive them. Lord, I release them today. Call them by name. I release. And you say their name. God, give me the grace to release them. They no longer have a, have a hold on me. I release them today. And the more you say that, it begins to grow. You begin to step into another trimester. And you're stretched. And you're uncomfortable. And as you continue to water the seed of forgiveness, you're able to give birth. And you're free. And one day you'll wake up and you'll realize, I'm free. And these are statements of mutual submission and relationships. I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? And I forgive you. Even if those, those, those three statements are really hard for you to say, I want to encourage you. Write them down. Begin to use them more. Begin to use them. And allow, through the power of the Holy Spirit, for you to build a healthy heart, healthy mind, healthy relationship in your marriage, in your family, with your children, with your church folks. Let's make that decision today. If you can, just bow your heads for a moment.